Dermot Gizzy Ling, thanks very much for coming on and speaking to myself and Cormac here today. I just wanted to start off, Dermot, and just say congratulations on the birth of Eru in January there. You were telling me you had a baptism in the lake for her. So why did you decide to do that and what was that experience like? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, it's a good start. Um, I suppose in one way there's there are... Um, processes that we use um, and that sometimes we we just walk along with um, a baptism being one of them there's the feeling of having to mark uh, mark her arrival or mark the arrival of a boy or a girl or whatever it is when you go through that process of change in a for 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 a man and, and Siobhan obviously for the woman you you decide to mark it and the way that society marks it quite often is through uh, a baptism and that follows a kind of a ceremonial uh experience that can sometimes leave you i i feel anyway it leaves me a little bit cold um to go into the church and even though you're surrounded by family and it's certainly um there's a fellow feeling and a and a, and a warm feeling in it a, the church isn't so central um the organization around religion isn't so central and the acknowledgement of the, the the deep spirituality that's going on at the time it, it it doesn't feel like it's being honored in the ceremony of baptism in a church and so we wanted to baptize eru into nature um that's our that's our temple that's the the god of nature that's what we're trying to infuse in her and to give her there's there's a time she was born on the 4th of january and the what what what, what is referred to as the fourth trimester takes place for the following three months which is essentially an extension of of life in the womb so it's inward in tribal cultures it's it's the woman is in on her own with the child in the dark like that's a it's the, the recreation of the conditions of the womb as best as possible for that fourth trimester. And then there's a movement outwards into the community, into the tribe and into nature. And so we wanted to mark that um, in, the, in, in, in the temple that we know, which is uh, out into nature. Uh, I guess in, in Kerry, we're definitely the likes of Clarny National Park like that's one of the few places left like you know there's not many places left we have let we've let them all go um as men we've let them all go as well we haven't protected them which is one of our roles and Killarney is 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 one of those places where the deer still run around freely there's wild goats up on the mountain the trees are doing the land is doing what the land wants to do it's not being it's not suffering human intervention. Um, it's been protected. So we knew we had the ideal spot. Um, running anything outside now is the, we've come to an interesting crossroads with COVID because indoor to have anything indoors is 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 looked upon as being reckless, I suppose. And uh, from the point of view of gathering a group of people, having something outdoors and only outdoors where there's no plan B. Is, is is also kind of reckless because Irish weather being as it is, uh, it can be ruined very quickly. But that's where the trust comes in. You know, that's where the notion of a ritual and being looked after, looked after by spirit comes in. Um, ceremonially, when you have a, a ceremony, everything is planned quite strategically from start to finish, leaving no space for the spirit, for the magic of things to come in. Yeah. Whereas when you have a ritual there's about 40 percent is planned and the other 60 percent is open for the spirit to come in and to guide events and it's just up to you to move with that and one of the one of the key areas of that if it's going to be outside is is, is trusting in the elements and we had uh, a stunning day and a small group of us gathered but a group of us gathered we got our families down and very close friends we had a harpist came down a friend of ours who just arrived the night before again out of nowhere called me at half 10 in the night and said, I'm in Tralee. I went to Leitrim and got a harp. I got a bus down here. And he sat on a rock on the side of the lake and played the harp while, while, while we, uh, while we, I, yeah, while, while we did everything that we had to do. And, uh, those kind of, that kind of magic, like that's, that's not that I, I'm aware that that's not everywhere. And, 
what we definitely want to do, I mean, part of it is obviously the blessing and the, the, the marking of the transition for Eru and the invite out into nature, both external and then in, into her own wild nature internally as well, like the invite to, to, to invite that out. But we're also, um, I suppose, role models in a sense, uh, martyrs in another sense, where we feel that this is this is more accessible. This is a more viable way for more people. But but some somebody has to do it and to say, look at here it is. This is what it is, and this is what it can be, and this is how beautiful it is, and this is how powerful it is. Uh, and so it serves kind of both of those purposes. Um, and yeah, it 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 couldn't have it couldn't have been any more beautiful. It couldn't have flowed any better. I mean, always after a ritual, after a game, after a show, after a podcast, you're always thinking, "Geez, I should have asked that, or I should have said that." You have those moments, and of course, you'd want to change things uh, in small ways. But ultimately, it served its purpose. Ultimately, we went out into the wild places to invite the the wildness inside of her to come out as well, and for her to live kind of life that way. Um, and yeah, in terms of in terms of showing the way or creating a, maybe a path that others can follow, it, it like you just couldn't recommend it anymore. You know, you couldn't recommend it anymore. You couldn't you couldn't say that that's that that's not a way um, for, for 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 a for a ritual like that. And and it happens at all the thresholds. You know, that's just that's just baptism. But we did this similar for for Ishna. He was. He was breastfed till he was about two. Um, you know, a, a lot of breastfeeding periods would be relatively short. Um, in, in tribal cultures, it, it extends out to two, three, four years um, till, till the child decides. And for Ishna, we gathered a group of men up in Dublin uh, around the fire and kind of initiated him out of that, out of his baby stage and into the little boy stage. And, and he responded to the magic as well. And at the time of that, honoring of where he was at he buried his head head in the muck in front of him I don't know why he did it he hasn't done it since he's never done it before but he buried his head into it and he looked up at everybody and there was soil all over his face and in the firelight and it was just wow. that was it it was coming it was a, a coming out of that time and then we went out and did you know I brought him to restaurants and brought him to places where it was like good 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 food good good flavors good tastes and and, and kind of baptized him into taste, you know, outside of of, of the of, of breast milk to give him that to, to welcome him and say this is the this is the variety, this is the beauty, this is the bounty of of life around you. And th th these are ways of just honoring those transitions. That's all it is. They're just transitions. And as the parents, uh, and for me as the man, like it, it's my responsibility to co-create those conditions with Siobhan to provide for them the the moment at which the allies can come in and say, yes, this is comfortable in with mammy. The, the breast milk is easy and it's there. And whenever you're upset or whatever it is that you go to it, that those, those, those things are true. But there's also this other thing and you're going to need a bit of assistance on that path. And we're going to get that from a brotherhood of men around you, which is what we did uh, from the Bowron, from singing songs, from the fiddle, from from the taste and the flavors of food from the fire you know these are all these are all kind of allies on that path so i know there's a um, i'm conscious i come from a different i come from a very different world a more conservative background certainly like this isn't it's certainly not how i i was brought up but i i see the value of it um and i and i've and i've watched it unfold in in both Ishna and now eru's life and uh and it's been hugely beneficial that's brilliant yeah, yeah. Sounds like an amazing ceremony. And I think them rituals are so important and something, as you said, the church maybe doesn't leave any space for spirit to come in. Or I think there's rituals, especially if moving from like the teenage years into adulthood, I think we need some sort of ritual for young men moving into adulthood because I think that has caused a lot of men to feel maybe in their late 20s that maybe they still haven't grown up fully so what would your thoughts be ah karmic sure i mean you couldn't be any you couldn't be any more on the button like what what's our what are our what are our rituals what are our equivalent rituals now like we go on the lash 
mm. you know, the lads go out for a lot of beers and maybe after five or six or ten, depending on, on who it is, they finally a little bit of emotion slips out and all of a sudden this hidden world comes to the surface. But it's chaotic and it's messy and it's in an environment where it's it's generally dark. There's music that's totally irrelevant to the to the situation. There's the people surrounding you aren't in on the same vibe at all. Uh, there's a messy, messy relationship with the with the opposite sex that mm-hmm. becomes about the ride and about uh, this kind of. It's a way like, and it's and it's certainly it's not without its enjoyment. Like it's certainly there's enjoyment in that. There's great enjoyment in being with the lads on the beer, or there's great enjoyment in you know discovering making love to a woman for the first time or having sex or whatever you want to call it. But this, this, it, it doesn't leave them, it doesn't leave our young men in particular, I feel, it doesn't leave our young men very well off as they go, as they go through their 20s because they haven't really marked that transition from the time of being a teenager and what we have essentially going around from maybe 20, often up as far as 60, is a, is, is a, a bunch of teenage boys who haven't really grown into their manhood. Um, and that, that's what the aim of the ritual is. It's, first of all, is to create the the stop and say right this is a period that you've gone through it's a glorious period it's full of messy exploration and all kinds of mistakes and that's all there all of those things all the things you're most ashamed of all the things you're afraid of all of those uncertainties and inadequacies they're all welcome in that time but now you can look back on those and say right I choose to let go of them and I'm going to invite in it's not just me my little small spirit and my little small ego that's going to solve all of these problems for myself I need allies I need a bigger force to come in and help me on that and that's all it's just an acknowledgement of that so it gives you a, a kind of punier sense of yourself that I think is a little bit more uh useful in a way because that is what the that that, that is what that that grown-up teenager is 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 somebody who's slowly retreating into their own small little version of themselves and that hardens off and then you become something and it becomes very difficult as years go on to break free of it so at the point of of acknowledgement you're just saying right this is an unfolding free-flowing thing and I can't control it because I'm not big enough to control it because there are far too many forces in the world uh, for me to just be able to control it myself so I'm going to call on my on on my my bloodline you know on the on the forces of my my grandparents or my parents or or whatever strengths that they had that you're looking to to embody um, of your community of your area of your place that have grown up and have responded responded to the, the the terrain in which they live and the demands of that terrain um, and then also spirit and that's a very it's a very loose one and can be kind of hard to grasp and grapple with people kind of maybe struggle with with that and, and it's really up to everybody to find what that is for themselves but f- for I suppose for me it's it's the it's it's it, the bigger forces of nature and the cycles of nature that when you begin to slow down and observe them a little bit more you realize that you they don't come in to assist you you can just slip into their flow a little bit easier and that flow has all of this energy in it for you to, to achieve whatever you want to achieve you know um and it's and it's very real it's not a it's not a make-believe thing like it's not a, it's not a, I don't feel like it's something I'm persuading myself is real it's something I've observed happening around me and I've observed events happening that uh that that shape that journey a little bit more um in the direction that I feel and that maybe the community feels is the right direction I know right. we start we started off now it may be blowing your heads off from the start oh, like, no, no, no. No. do you know what like it's all resonating with me complete because like for me i got completely sucked into how you described the way the teenagers were mm. like going on the beer going on the lash and like things would always come up for me in them situations like they'd start pouring out at different times like different emotions and stuff and you'd be chatting with your mates you might have a two hour long conversation at nine o'clock in the morning at a house party about all these deep emotions and then at nine o'clock in the morning they're somehow start- <laughs> <laughs> good party. Yeah. And you'd be having those deep conversations and then the next morning you you just never speak about it again. Mm. Um and it's only in them vulnerable states, but you'd never let yourself get to that vulnerable state normally. No. And 
the last time I came out of treatment two years ago or close to it for the last time and treatment for what? Uh, alcohol and drugs. Okay. So I battled with that for over 10 years and yeah. that's, well, it's one of the main reasons I got into what myself and Cormac are doing now, trying to help teenagers. So like learn from our mistakes. Yeah. Now Cormac's path was obviously very different to mine, but it's like, it took me, it took me to hit absolute rock bottom and um, not wanting to be alive anymore. It took me to hit that mm. to come out of it. Yeah. And, and realize that it's all, like all that holding in emotions and trying to put on that mask. Like everyone's mm. walking around with their mask. Like you said, it's mm. that hardened shell. And I think it's what we and comic trying to do. It's so important to try and bring people out of that, out of, away from their mask early on. So they don't have to go down the same roads. And like, I, I think I'm lucky I got out of it at 29, do you know? Um, and I don't think it's a, by all means, I'm at any sort of end. It's just constantly growing and stuff. And yeah, um, like I had to come back to my brothers, you know, like my family, the people that I was with at the very beginning and forget about everyone else I met along the way. I had to come back to them to find like kind of my purpose and my way in life. And like one thing I wanted, I did want to ask you was, would I be right in saying you're the, the, the oldest of four brothers? Second oldest. Second oldest, so you're the same as Cormac. Then I was the oldest, and growing up, growing up, that really, that really shaped us growing up. I think you know we'd be having so much fun, like messing, playing around. It more usually would end up in the four of us fighting with each other as well, you know. So we just kind of that was the way we kind of grew up. But it was like having that bond with them is like that solid, unbreakable connection. Even when you weren't getting on, it was always there, and you always knew it was there, and. That's a very, I suppose, comforting thing to have as well. And it was funny that I ended up having to come back to that then to find myself again. And mm. what I wanted to ask you was, how how do you feel that that shaped you growing up with four bro- brothers like that as well? Uh, the roles are very the, the roles are very interesting. Like for you now, for, for as the eldest, like I see in my own oldest brother, like he he took the heat. Like you know, he had to go. He had to go his own way um and and provide once we came along and i think and it's really interesting seeing that observing that at the moment with ishna <clears throat> he was the center he was center stage uh for the last two and a half years and or for the last three years and then all of a sudden eru has come in and it seems like to him that he's been pushed off center stage because he's still in that he's still in that process of of grieving that that position but he'll slowly come to the realization and is slowly coming to the realization. He's just sharing that center stage <clears throat> and we're there to, I suppose, encourage him to embrace it in that way. But you have to acknowledge that like that. Ha- and, and a three year old. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm hanging around for 39 odd years or 38 years. And I might think that because I'm around here for that long that I have some kind of uh, superiority on him, but there's ways in which he's far more superior than I am. Like I, I get lost in the intellectual world, uh, the word, the world of words and, uh, and, and my understandings that are attached to him. And he doesn't have those. He's responding to energy all the time. And so if we can kind of, if we're trying to shape him and help him to understand that at the moment, but not through doing it intellectually explaining to him necessarily, that's a small part of it, but just to help guide him uh, in, 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 a, in our actions and, and acknowledge that struggle for him in, in our actions towards him. So that's one break. And I think that's maybe something that a lot of, I'm not sure for, for women because I, 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 I've, I haven't experienced that, but for men, definitely uh, I see, I observe it, I feel regularly enough anyway, that the eldest takes on the role um, the, they're displaced first. I'm not sure that that's, if, if that hasn't been healed, then that moves into the next stage of when you're uh, forming a kind of a blanket around your younger brothers, you're, you're protecting them and it's you, the kids and the parents. And it's, it's not like you're defending them against them, but these are your, these are your brothers, like, and you have to protect them and you have to show good behavior and you have to show um, a certain way of being in the world. And I think that that, that amounts to, if it's not diffused early enough, a huge pressure on the eldest, a huge, huge pressure. And 
one that if, if, if it isn't diffused in time, I think it's inevitable that it leads down maybe some dark roads. There are there are plenty of people who would probably argue that you know you might need you might have needed or people need to go to the very bottom uh, to find what they needed to find to bring them on their purpose. But I suppose you'd wonder if somebody came to you at those crucial stages as you hit manhood or when you were coming into your teenage years or whatever and said, okay, like this is what these things are probably familiar to you. This is this is what's going on, and this is why it's happening. And you don't need to attach any form of uh, blame or or or, or um, self-flagellation because you're going through that. This is a necessary role that you've played. It's a valuable role that you've played. We're honouring the role that you've played. But now you're going to move on, and you can release it and let it go. And there's nothing to say that you couldn't hit your purpose then at 19 and 20 and be already 10 years into it and have the world that you're both dreaming up now uh, to have started that process 10 years before you know like maybe you don't need to go to the dark places without any assistance because that's what happens you go in to the dark places when you go raw you go in with no assistance and that's really really tough like that's a that's a hard journey blessed are you to have the brotherhood to come back to like the, 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 the brotherhood of kin to come back to who say no matter what man no matter what we are with you like what a what a what a fucking beautiful powerful thing that is like it's 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 it sets you up you know it sets you up to come back strip everything back and say well we have each other and now we'll go back into the world and we'll reimagine our our, our roles in it you know in my experience i my brother left and went to america when he was 17 and really loved america and wanted to escape uh ireland i think because he just wasn't comfortable here. Um, he was playing hurling, as was the religion of our family. And as the eldest, I think the most expectation was probably heaped on him. And so it was a, it was a bit of a battleground for himself and my father. The eldest brother and the father, it's always a really interesting relationship, like in terms of what the, the father what the father wants for him and how much he infuses his own stunted growth or stunted beliefs or stunted experiences, how much is infused upon him. Like, you know, so he, in, in our case, anyway, um, Davey left and that was a big blow to, to all of us. And it, but it meant for me totally not realizing at the time, but it meant for me, I had to step up into the role of the big brother maybe when things went south for you maybe karma had to maybe do the same you know it's maybe yeah. stand in and say right this role is now it's vacant and i'm just going to fill it not necessarily consciously but just because it's there to be filled and that's for the second brother is is i i really struggled with that because i was totally unfamiliar to it totally unprepared by it but just because he had done such a good job because he had guided us and looked after us and put a put an arm around us for so long that I, I didn't I didn't really know how to I didn't really know how to be in that role so I played it and did it as best I could and um my father had a stroke uh at when I was maybe 20 um Davey was away he came back and he was he was he was gone again and I didn't really I, I played it as best I could um trying to trying to please the mother trying to please the feminine trying to make everything right trying to solve things you know giving all of my energy to this worthless worthless task in some respects because it's it's as 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 many men find out on on, on the path like you know there's no pleasing in in totality anybody but certainly not pleasing the feminine uh because they know that the energy that you're bringing is trying to please it and that's never a real energy that's a <clears throat> that's a, a an action that resembles something real but it's not it's not quite it's not quite true you know so it's taken me some time and still not fully out of it but it's certainly taken me time to to come out of that role and to re-establish myself uh as as a brother as well for sure but also just in in how my relationships with my brothers my relationship with my mother and my relationship with my father how that moves out into all my relationships how i put that out into any 50 60 year old woman i meet any 50 60 year old man that i meet any 30 year old man that i meet those those attitudes just they, they, they're all they're so ingrained they're so conditioned that they that they slip out and so it, it requires uh, and uh, uh, some mastery of consciousness to be able to say 
that's what I'm doing there. I don't need to keep doing that because it's a bleed of my energy, my very, very valuable life force that I want to do the work that I am here to do in the world myself. Um, I need to stop bleeding that energy out and I need to hold it and, and wait to see where is the invite for my work, you know? So it's, um, there's so much in it, you know, there's just, there's so much in that one. It's, it's hard to break it all down, but just in your experience, that, that's, that, that, that's as, that's as much as I can maybe, uh, that's as much as resonates in, in my own, you know? Yeah. It's fun. Like, it's funny you said your brother left at 17 and you were left with the task of taking the older brother. Cause I left when I was 19 for years. So Cormac was, Cormac was left with the, you know? Yeah. And, yeah, I could see the heads not. I could see the heads nodding. So I was like, "Oh yeah, I, yeah, it's all resonating there." <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Just on that um, brotherhood that we've been talking about, and how important it is for men to kind of have that place to come back to with other men. Obviously, the relationships with women are important as well. Or if you have a partner, um, you can get a lot from that relationship in terms of supporting you through hard times. But um, I, I was chatting to you. Just a couple of days ago, I was saying we had our first men's circle there at the weekend. Ooh, and it wasn't my idea now. It was a couple of my mates that came to me, came to me and Daryl and were saying they wanted to do a men's circle. And, like, and would we be interested in kind of helping out and stuff? So we yeah. were like, <clears throat> kind of, something we always kind of thought of doing maybe. So we were delighted we did it. But it was, Richard, a, it was inevitable for you, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah I suppose. Yeah, yeah. It's it was inevitable. It was inevitable. And I think... Just what we got from it, like there was about nine or ten of us there, yeah, and it was, was powerful. Powerful. We went up to the woods, just down the road beside the river, and yeah. just had to sat around the fire. But yeah, the, it was just something that, as we talked about earlier, like in Irish society, we just don't have them vulnerable conversations in that environment. It's always when you drink mm. too much and <clears throat> bed, and then the next day you forget about what was said. So it was just really refreshing and kind of a new experience for most of us. Mm. But um. I just wanted to maybe ask, like, how do men get that brotherhood or find their brothers if they don't have them in their family? Or what is it that we get from other men by coming together in that thing? Is it like reigniting our masculinity or what? Mm. What do you see as the importance of coming together as <clears throat> men? I suppose uh, the first point is is showing up yourself. Like I think that the invites come after that. Like you, you boys have started off on a particular track and... I mean, if I if I was to meet you at the start of that journey, say right, like obviously men's circles are are going to be one of your one of your main uh, arenas, because <clears throat> do you know you can meet one on one, and and it's and it's good to do that from time to time, you know, to be in that just solid conversation with somebody who needs it, and once you start vibrating at a certain level men will gather around you and they'll start coming to you and they'll start asking you, hey lads, can you do more of this please? Because there's a there's a need for it. Um, but if it's it's not surprising that, the, that an invite comes to do it, but if you see in the individual, you get so much and you can only ever get so much because you've got the limitations of two individuals. When you're in a group, like group dynamics are so, so interesting, so magnificently interesting because you're forced, you're forced into something that you can't be in an individual conversation. And there's all kinds of uncertainty in that. And inevitably something comes up or something happens <clears throat> that will invite uh, an instinctive part of everybody out at the one time. And at that time, there's an unveiling. You see people an awful lot clearer. And if one person, generally it'll, it'll happen in group dynamics like that, that one person will, will, will go on a, a small version of a healing journey. And that witnessing that for other men is a very powerful thing. And that will bring healing out in them. That, that is healing for them. So in a group, even if it only happens with one person, it happens for the whole group. And then more, more just begins to filter out. It's just more because, because lads see, they're like, oh yeah, like we're, I'm missing this. Like I'm this, this whole side of me is not being met by the, the by the, 
the kind of uninteresting ways in which we navigate society of going to coffee shops and going to work and going home and going to the gym and playing a few games and going on the beer or whatever like it's just it's just not interesting to, to to that to that part of the body that really wants to be met in some way and so i think in in groups like in groups man I, when, when I started working with SOAR in Dublin, we had a fella come over from Australia, uh, Tom Harkin, who, who is at the forefront of this movement of where you guys are in, in, uh, in Australia, in the whole of Australia. The bloke whisperer, I think they call him over there, which he doesn't, <laughs> he doesn't like one bit. Um, and I saw, I saw, I, I watched him, somebody in their mastery, somebody who left school at 17 or 18 and went the, the reach way, went and down the road that Jim Steins had paved, uh, and I, the, the the Dublin footballer, um, and and Aussie rules player, and he just committed to that, and he was his own his 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 reading room was his own university, and it was all about how to observe, how to observe yourself and how to observe others, how to open up group dynamics, how to how to run ritual, how to understand ceremony. He he just he just went towards it with everything that he had. And I saw him reading the room, like looking at what was happening in the room, looking why people were sitting beside each other, looking why they placed themselves closer to the door or not, looking why they, they placed themselves beside a, a, a kind of a, a maternal figure in the room. And I was totally and utterly blown away by it because I, I was a primary school teacher before that where we had the old dynamic of the pulpit essentially where I have some information and I need to teach you or I need to impart my wisdom onto you you know, uh, empty soul sitting in front of me that I'm now going to feel. And he was like, no, 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 it's all, all the, all the, all, all the information, all the energy, all the lessons, all the teachings, they're all in the group. It's your job to steer and to move the dynamics of that group for it to come out. And that's the only rule you have. And, and a, a facilitator is, is what it's called, but there's people of different levels of skill where you say, okay, that's, that's what that, that's what this is. And I saw him doing that and I thought, I don't know, do I, is there anything else I kind of want to do sometimes other than just be in groups uh, of, 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 of men in particular um, to try and cultivate those same uh, conditions. And uh, similar to yourselves, a fella, a friend of mine, Patrick O'Leary, from, uh, he has a, a band called I Have a Tribe, a beautiful, beautiful musician and a former hurler. And he asked me last year, would I run a stag for, a, for his closest friend? And I had been thinking about about exactly what we're talking about. You know, this is this this is another time for a marking, a huge time uh, of marking, because you're saying goodbye to your to, to 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 your single life, your bachelorhood as a man, in which you have this freedom, and all of a sudden you're coming in now, and you're you're coming into unison with the feminine, and that's going to bring up a whole lot of stuff, and you have to be ready to go into that battle. And I just. I couldn't get over the, I, I, so what we did was I brought them to Clarny National Park uh, as well as it happened and gave them out like, this was actually your, your man's idea, Patrick's idea. He had just brought 20 like flowery women's dresses with like hats and bonnets and all kinds of things. And we dressed all the lads up. Now they were standing there drinking their cans of Heineken and, and I accepted that, that was fine. Uh, and they dressed up as women and we played a hurling match on this big open space surrounded by great conifers. And it was wild crack. It was brilliant. And they were just, they were totally and utterly they gave everything that they have had to it and that was perfect and I knew it was going to be perfect because when you play hurling a certain way there's something in Irish men I believe that just comes out of them that's 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 pretty that's gorgeous you know mm -hmm. uh, but then I brought them down to there's a, a lake and a small beach at the lake and there's some old um, Scots pines fallen and I where the Scots pines had fallen the roots had come up you know you see that when the roots come up and I tied a tarp across the the roof of that put down a little small half gas cylinder and lit a fire there and put down 20 hessian sacks and the lads all sat around and it was all like you know these were these were smart freaking you know these are dubs born and raised and they were sharp and they were witty and they're too quick for me uh, in many respects and they were having a bit of a laugh and I gave them the space to have their little bit of a laugh but we lit the fire and we had a drink and we, we passed a bottle of whiskey around and everybody got a little a little shot of it and <clears throat> I asked them to write down something about uh something about their friend who was getting married 
uh, either that honoured their relationship as single men or something, a blessing that you wanted to give him of some sort on his journey into this new way. <clears throat> and they just, I didn't know what they were going to do. I gave them the option of burning it in the fire because that's enough to send it off up into the the, the, the other world or, or else just give it to him. And to my surprise, pretty much all of them gave it to him. And then a, a free flowing conversation just took place between everybody where it was it was clear uh, that they were well up for honouring him when the time came, uh, even though there wouldn't have been a prayer in hell that they'd have done it in any other situation. And they invited me then afterwards to go into Killarney, and I made the mistake, I think, in some respects I made the mistake of going with them, because I think when you hold these things, it's important to pull back, to pull away, to not go into the ordinary world, to stay back and say, right, I've done my... I, I'm going to break there. I've done my work and that's it. But they were a lovely bunch of fellas. And so I went with them and I was all very new for me as well. And I went with them and almost to a man, it blew me away how much, how hungry they were for conversation. They each wanted to get me on their own at some stage to say, I did this and I played this and I followed this and I, and, I, and it broke me, it broke me and nobody knows that it broke me and I can't tell anybody that it broke me because it's not, it, there's never the conditions where I can tell them and here they are telling me and I'm like, geez man, I don't, I don't know you but I, I hear you, I hear your story, I hear what you're saying <clears throat> but you have to, that has to be processed, you have to do something with that because you can't carry it around anymore, you know but it was, it was beautiful, but it was sad. Like, you know, I, I did feel the sadness of it too. I said, here, here are these lads who <clears throat> bright and capable and articulate, um, but, but were bottling up so much and it was causing them so much distress. Um, but yeah, there was, there was, there was, there was healing in the day of it. And, and, and that's, uh, and that's the possibility. Uh, that's the possibility of the group work. And that's why it's becoming more prevalent day by day. Uh, there's more and more men beginning to gather. Um, it's hard to know how to frame it. I find it's hard to know you're talking about the fire, you're talking about vulnerability, you're talking about going to the forest. And most men are just like, what are you talking about? Like vulnerability, like sure. That's the, that's, encoded in my dna the last thing that i want to deal with like that's not on the table everything else on the table but that's not um but they don't realize that you know they have these parties and at nine o'clock in the morning they do end up opening up and it becomes messy and it becomes chaotic and they share with people that aren't worthy of their of their message and of their struggle and uh that's a much sadder way that's a much harder way uh to go i think so I, I like it's, that's why I come on here anyway is because I just think like fair play to you like you know keep doing it and keep opening up more and more and it'll keep growing and they'll keep coming that's just the way it's going to go I think mm, yeah I think people will get drawn to that kind of thing you know when they hear other people are doing it yeah. <laughs> it's just about taking that first step and a lot of people are afraid to do it I asked a few different people if they would, if they'd like to come down and join, and like you said, when you mentioned a few of the things of what it is, they're kind of like, "What the fuck is that like?" Yeah. But like one particular person actually said, I, "I'd need a, I'd need a, heap, I'd need a heap of drink to go to something like that." You know what I mean? Yeah. I, well, it'd be kind of defeating the purpose if you were like that at it, you know. But um, yeah, I get uh, one of the things, Daryl. I think like you, you also there's also an opportunity to look at your strengths. There is that time of being in the forest and being by the fire and and those moments. But I look now, like I've wondered for the last few years as I've begun to move in groups of people who are doing this kind of thing all the time. And w sometimes when I see the the power that they have uh, and the beauty, like that just is. They mightn't be magazine beautiful or they mightn't be television beautiful, but they're beautiful beyond all of that. Like it's just bursting out of them. And I've kind of wondered, Jesus, what do I, am I going to be found out here? Like, what do I have? What do I have for, for yeah. them? And funnily enough, what I have for them is hurling. Uh, and what, what one of the things we do down here now and have been doing for a good while is we've been meeting on a Sunday and playing a hurling match. Uh, Sometimes there's four people, sometimes there's 15. And we play on the beach. Uh, everything is well spread out. We play a game and it brings people together. And if I was to call now for a group, uh, a meeting to go into the forest, I'd have eight of the 15. Mm. Now, if I asked them to go into the forest at the start, they wouldn't come into the forest unless they had a forest to drink on them. Yes, but yes. 
because I'm because I'm doing what what I'm I, what I what I'm what I'm here to do in some respects, and I feel that about hurting. Like it's it's just it's been such a blessing. Like when I do that, that brings people to you, and then you could get to move. Um, so if it's going to be a communal at the moment, people are just dying to be outside. Their physical well being, they're giving out about uh, gyms being closed and stuff. But you're there's a wall here beside me full of rocks, and I guarantee you, if you were here beside me, you'd have. 40 things to do with each one of those rocks in the space of five minutes that is to do with strengthening the body in some way and that's what people are looking for so it's very easy to get them when you when when you're on when you're on your on, on the right track and then bring them that step further it's a bigger invite but if they've come with you so far they'll come with you the rest of the way i think since this lockdown as well since it's since the first one last year um I know I said a lot of people aren't open to it, but a lot, a lot more people are that I speak to. It's not as mm. I think a lot of people have done. I've tried it out, like they've been getting out into nature more and stuff. Mm. So mm. They've, they've noticed the kind of beauty of it because they're not. Do you know that mad, crazy, busy work life? I was in it myself as well. Do you know what I mean? You mm. won't be taking a second to appreciate anything that's actually around you. Mm. you know, we found that place we had the men's circle. We only found that. Last year, at the start of lockdown, we were down there the whole time, down at the river, um, having a little barbecue, <laughs> spending time down there. And I think, I think I have noticed a lot more people are kind of into that thing now. So it, there probably is much more of a chance that we can bring more people on this journey with us. Do you know, it's mm-hmm. so yeah, it will be. It'll be interesting to see how it unfolds. I'm excited for it because that was we had done a few circles already, mm. yeah, mixed ones, which were great, fantastic. Yeah. But there was something about that with just the men the other night. And I'm sure it's the same when the women do their own circles as well. Yeah. Um, something that's just incredibly mm. powerful about it. Mm. Like I couldn't. I remember I just sitting there at one point and the sun was coming through the trees and everyone, nobody was talking. We were just sitting around the fire and mm. like this, a, an overwhelming sense of peace that I, mm. that I rarely still get. Like, Beautiful. yeah, it was just like nowhere. I, I remember I said it, it was like, it was just nowhere else. I just wasn't mm. thinking of being anywhere else. And even when I'm in a Zen enough state, I'm still maybe thinking, oh, I need to go here. <laughs> there was just none of that. It was just gone. It's a frightful thing, isn't it? I, I remember I remember talking to a fella uh, who, who put words on the experience for me um, to not be to not be comfortable in your own skin is a well-known uh, phrase, you know, but it, it's used so often that it's cliched and you don't really know what it means. But the notion to carry <clears throat> the notion that you're not quite right, that you're not quite in the right place, that you're not quite in the right time, that you're not quite with the right people, that you could be somewhere else, that you should be somewhere else, that you should be doing something else. That is a, a, such an exceptionally destructive feeling. Uh, and I felt it all of my life. It's such a destructive feeling. Um, and it really, I mean, you have to answer that. You have to deal with that. You have to deal with it. There's no, there's no, you might not deal with it for 10 years. You might not deal with it. You might deal with it tomorrow, but you have to deal with it. There's no two ways about it because that's not as you experience in that time of peace, of a deep knowing that where you are in the world, there's nothing else is required. There's nothing else missing. There's nothing you're not, you're, you're whole, the feeling of being whole. And that's, like what what a gift and when you're experiencing that too everybody else is seeing you go through that and that brings them into their into their version of it in in a way too you know and and i think it's interesting as well with in in terms of you doing that with with the men the difference with the women as well i mean i think part of the demand for us to do it now as well for ourselves is that we're looking at i mean in Killorglin, which is a very small small town uh, not far maybe an hour from us here there's 80 women 80 women meeting up and going swimming every single day during the lockdown 80 of them not a single man among them and there was an open invite but it was the women who responded women are meeting women are having uh these circles women are gathering women are developing uh, a deeper power at the moment and we're kind of looking at them wondering jesus like you know where's that going to go or how's that like, how are you finding that stuff in a way? Like, not that, not in the sense of, I mean, if you're looking at it and saying, well, I don't want what you have for sure, of course, because they're women, you know, they, they're they're developing different powers. But there is a demand, I feel, from 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 the feminine that's, that's societally female, but 
from the feminine, there's a demand for the masculine to stand up, mm. to stand up and, and to, to become accountable for our actions, to become accountable for the wholesale destruction of nature, for to become accountable for the way we treat animals, for to be accountable for how we treat each other. Like that's the demand. And so there's very slow early steps in that. And part of that is, I think anyway, is coming into exactly what you're describing, Daryl, is to come into a sense of peace. And from that place, the path just opens up and becomes clearer. And, and there's nothing woo-wee about that. Like, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. That's that's not to be, you can listen to that and say, oh, that's a lot of hippy-dippy shit or whatever. And you can take that lazy attitude to it if you want to. But you know when you feel the, 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 the experience of peace. Like that's for everybody. Like you know, that's for I, that's for everybody. You'd, you'd 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 only when you feel that. I think the first thing you do is, is say I want to create conditions where more people can feel that. That's mm -hmm. such a beautiful thing, and there's no dart. There's no lack of energy, and there's no oh Jesus, I better keep that for myself because that's a really precious thing, and I have to hold on to it. It's like no, fuck, this is everywhere, and it's available all the time. I remember standing. <clears throat> on the side of I went down to Doge and Beira and I was down there for three weeks and I haven't and I've purposely not told this story to very many people because as soon as you share some of these stories they lose power for yourself mm. um, so there is, a, there, is a, there is an aspect of importance in keeping some things to yourself definitely but I went in a camp down there I was in Doge and Beira I was struggling big time at the time and I was trying to find my way out uh, of a few things and one of the Dojimbera itself, even as isolated as it is down there, there was still people there, and I was I still felt a little bit hemmed in by that. So I took a tent and walked off across the land uh, to this peninsula outcrop where there was nothing, there was no houses, there was just there was just sheep, and I went out there and pitched a tent on the side of a cliff in a little hollow brought a bit of food, uh, cooked, like put stones in onto the fire, cooked me chicken on the stones, cooked me a bit of food uh, and, and stayed there for two or three days. But on the second morning, I went out to the cliff and I was practicing at the time Qigong, uh, just something that was just like a, a, a essentially a movement of the body, uh, a meditative movement of the body, which I know you fellas know, but for people uh, who haven't come across it, and I was practicing that and, and all of a sudden, <clears throat> it was breathing, just breathing normally in and doing the movements with the body. And all of a sudden I could feel this like physical force, like not a, not a movement of my mind that thought this is peace or this is, I, I'm, I'm okay here. There was a physical energy coming in from somewhere. And every time I breathed it in, it just, it was just going straight into my chest. And I thought to myself, I was after having loads of problems with my stomach. So I said, right, this is it now. This is your chance. Get that, take that energy and bring it down into your stomach because your stomach needs healing. So I started doing that for a while. And I just sat there on the side or stood there on the side of, of the mountain, breathing this power. And I was thinking, because the mind was still going a little bit, it was like, where is this coming from? Is this from the sun? Is it from the universe? Is this, like, what is what the words, all of the words that the philosophers and the poets and the writers talk about? Like, where is this coming from? And then I was like, well, just forget about where it's coming from because it's coming and enjoy every second of it because it's, 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 it's medicine. It's big. Moriarty, John Moriarty talks about big medicine. It's big medicine. It's the big medicine of the universe. And it's coming in for free. You don't need anybody else. You don't need any drugs companies. You don't need anybody else to heal those, those, those deep, deep diseases in yourself. They are free and freely available if you can cultivate the circumstances to find it. And that is glorious good news. Like, that's great news, you know. So these things are possible. It's not, it's not as far off. It's not as... It's not as ephemeral it's not as it's not as i don't know what labels people put on these things but it's it's not it's not the big deal necessarily that you think it is mm. uh to cultivate those those circumstances it's just ad, kind of admitting yourself onto the journey of finding it is where the big step is and i wouldn't for a second disrespect anybody who refuses that journey in any one moment because it's a oh. difficult difficult journey yeah, I think there's a Chinese saying, it's like, if you're not going to finish the journey, don't bother starting it because it's a difficult one. But mm. for me, it's the only way.